because you had the opportunity today to speak with the Honorable Belvin Perry, America's judge. And uh, I love uh, spending time with him. Uh, such a, a, a warm, warm man, but an incredible jurist and really tells it like it is. Yeah. You know, when I covered the Casey Anthony case and I sat in his courtroom for months on end, um, you know, one of the delightful memories I have of him is walking across the street during lunch breaks to the restaurant across the way. And it was like the chance that I had to talk with him a little bit. And I got to know little bits and pieces of him day after day, week after week, covering Casey Anthony. And I fell in love with him. I mean, I really did fall in love with this guy. He's just, uh, he calls it as he sees it, straight down the middle. And he's very, very smart. He's been, you know, the former chief judge of the Florida Ninth Circuit for decades. And um, I thought of him, Vinny, right away on this case, because the case involves children who were missing, who were discovered in, in, in I say skeletal remains. I really don't know if they've been skeletonized. I don't know what the condition of their remains were, but it will be important. And I talked to the judge about the significance, the similarities to Casey's case and the stories that the bodies of those children will tell to any courtroom that ultimately uh, will come down the line. And here are some of the questions and answers um, that we had in, in a very profound conversation about cases like this in general and this case in particular. Talk to me a little bit about how difficult this case could end up being, given the fact that these are children and given the fact that these are remains that could have been buried a long time. The big question in this case, uh, depending on the condition of the bodies, which we do not know, is the cause of death. Uh, that will tell us a great deal about this case. It will tell us about the manner of death, whether or not these uh, children suffered, uh, and hopefully there's enough of these bodies that are left uh, that we can find that information. It is striking, and in fact, I thought of you right away, how similar some of the aspects of this case may be to the Casey Anthony case over which you presided and over which millions and millions of people were wrapped in, in details. Do you see the similarities? There are a number of similarities. Uh, one, you have two kids. You have a community out there that was concerned about the kids. You have a, a mother in this particular case, unlike Casey, she really wasn't that cooperative with the police or didn't even appear to show a great deal of, of concern, which set off a number of alarm uh, buttons. You have the family members there who notified the police and expressed their concern just like the Anthony's uh, did in this particular case. When you have a mother who is obstinate about helping find a missing child, and then, uh, God forbid, those children end up dead, is there a color over any kind of legal proceedings that makes it very, very difficult to just follow the pristine law and have jurors follow the pristine case? It is always gonna be difficult in these type of cases because What's going to happen is people are going to harken back to what happened to Lil' Kelly. And, and they're going to think about those two little darling kids uh, in the same way. The interesting thing about this case that sets this case a little different uh, from the Anthony case is the mom's religious beliefs. The fact that the stepfather was involved in this particular case. In the Anthony case, for all we know, Casey acted alone. In this particular case, it is quite evident that there were two people involved. And the question is, why? Why did this happen? Why did these two kids die? And religion is clearly going to factor prominently into this case, but how does it actually affect the case? She had some very strange and bizarre religious beliefs. Uh, there's been reports that she believed that these kids were zombies. So you're going to see that playing in the role of whether or not this was an intentional murder or whether or not it was something less, whether or not there's going to be any attempt to have a defense involving mental defects. So all those things are going to unfold as we go through the discovery process we learn what statements she said to others about her religious beliefs 
and whether or not she in fact practiced those beliefs. In any case, um, certainly a murder case, uh, and certainly a murder case involving children, evidence is difficult to uh, consume when you're in the courtroom. It is extremely difficult for jurors because they get it up close. They sometimes touch and feel the evidence. And in this particular case, it is very likely that jurors will see the remains of children. How does that change the metric of other cases, other murder cases, when it's children involved and when those images are so difficult to see? In all my years on the bench, the most difficult thing to ask a jury to do is to view the autopsy photographs of the remains of children. It's a very emotional part. Uh, some jurors will cry, some jurors will look and, and uh, turn their heads away. Uh, it, it takes an emotional toll on the jurors, and it definitely takes an emotional uh, hold on even the lawyers that's in there, even though they may have tried to attempt to appear stone face, but it's a very emotional moment. For the most part, I don't know if lay people know this, but you as the judge, are really their uh, partner to this process and their advocate. How often do you have to step in and, and help out in some way when that is the case? Remains or children and jurors are struggling? Well, most of the time you, you try to give an instruction uh, to the jury to warn them what they are about to see. Uh, so you just won't put it uh, to them without any warning. You, you got to give them an opportunity to emotionally brace themselves for, for what they're about to view. It's, it's not something that they're used to seeing. Judge Perry, if anyone knows how to preside over a high-profile trial, it's you. You handled the Casey Anthony case and the entire world was watching. Um, you know, it's very likely as this you know, crime moves forward, there will be yet another high-profile trial. What's your advice for the players involved, from the judge to the prosecutors, to the defense attorney's family and, and the media alike? What's your advice for them going forward? Number one, you try not to create a, a circus-type atmosphere. Number two, you want to hold as much information out to the public, but you don't want to get it so that you can't select the jury there. And uh, number three is the process of jury selection, because what you want to ensure is why you want an informed community, you want to make sure that you're able to host that trial in that particular venue with jurors that understand that particular area. Jury selection in a case of this nature in a small community is going to be very difficult. The key question is, is whether or not that jury can lay aside any opinions that they may have formed and decide that case solely on the facts as presented in the courtroom as applied to the law. Some people can do that, and some people can't do it. And it's, it's going to be very hard to, to get a jury there. But you look at if the trial is a year from now or a year and a half, a lot of that will die down. Uh, and hopefully they will be able to select a good jury. Presuming that this ends up as a full-blown case um, in Idaho, how does one go about jury selection differently given the nature of this particular series of events? This particular case is going to produce a, a unique circumstance that deals with religion and religious beliefs and practices. So you're going to have to determine with that particular potential jury panel what their particular beliefs are and what do they think about the beliefs that she was practicing. So that's going to play a major role because it's going to be a factor in their decision making. Judge Perry, there are no fathers who are alive of these particular two children. And I'm wondering if that makes any difference in this case because, you know, there's no immediate family members um, of these children who would effectively be in court and have eye contact with, with juries because that matters. Juries see families and they're, they feel a connection. It's tragic that the fathers would not be available, but hopefully there will be other family members that will be there uh, to represent uh, these two 
children. Uh, to me, that is very important, not necessarily for the jury, but for the healing of the family. Because when the child is said and done, they have to go on, they have to live. And of course, any all of this, um, we are sort of putting the cart before the horse uh, somewhat, even though Lori and Chad are both charged and sitting in jail. They're not charged with murder. So there will be some kind of, you know, litigation, and who knows uh, what kind of litigation. I suspect there will be murder charges, given where those remains were found. Um, but I do think it's really interesting what uh, Judge Perry said about the media um, and recommending try not to make this into a circus. Easier said than done sometimes. However, I say that at this point, it's not the same cultural environment as Casey Anthony's uh, case was. It was many years ago. Uh, we are dealing with an uh, international pandemic. Um, we are dealing with a uh, policing revolution. Uh, we are in an election year. Um, but all of this is now. And any kind of murder case, uh, if there's going to be one, is going to be some time from now, like a year or two from now. So who knows what the climate will be like? Right. Uh, another difference is we won't be down in, in Disney World. We'll be in Idaho. So that's a, that's a, that's a difference, too. Um, two things from that interview. Uh, talking about someone being there, um, just like in Casey Anthony, um, J.J.'s grandparents will be there. Uh, but their role, much different than George and Cindy Anthony. Because George and Cindy Anthony, obviously, you know, very split because it was a death penalty case and their child is on trial in a death penalty case, but they were there for Kaylee Marie. So that's a little different. And then getting back to the death penalty, I wonder if that's going to be a similarity or difference if we ever get murder charges here, if this one will be a death penalty case. Or if the prosecutors will look at what happened in the Casey Anthony case and that it might have been overreach. Listen, I'm just saying, I was an observer in that. I spoke to the jurors afterwards, and I think maybe that might have been the fatal mistake of prosecutors. They went too far. They asked too much of a jury, but they couldn't deliver every single one of the goods. And guess what it was that really hung them up? Cause of death. Cause of death for Casey. And they just couldn't get it in their minds that this young woman, or Kaylee, that this young woman sitting across the court from them was capable of smothering her baby while staring in her eyes and sticking a, a sticker over her face. They just didn't believe that much. They believed something happened. They just didn't believe what the prosecutor said happened. Yeah, well, there was duct tape there, and there were the stickers, and the body was discarded Oh, it was ugly. Woods, like no, trash. no, no. Mm, don't get yeah. me wrong. It was ugly but it was what the prosecutors laid out as what Casey's role was in all that stuff, that it, was, it just wasn't proven. The evidence wasn't there that she did all that. And it just was too much with a death penalty case for them. Yeah, I'm never going to agree with those folks from Pinellas County. I, I just can't. <laughs> I, can't I, did, listen, I understood. It. I just can't. I, can't. I sat there. I, can't. I understood. I'm not going to fault them. They did their duty, but I, I'll, I'll never, ever agree with them. You know what our old friend Jack Ford Actually, always great said, right? Stuff. Justice, justice happens. What was that? Justice happens. It's just that one side of the court won't be happy with it. Yeah, exactly. Well, well stated. Ashley, thanks so much. Sure thing.